Do you think cello saved your life? Definitely, because if I wouldn't be the cellist, I wouldn't be alive. Physically, I mean, it's not just because, oh, oh my God, the cello, I could have, no. If I wouldn't have been a cellist and a successful one, the people who were responsible saving me wouldn't have saved me. My two brothers have gone, and uh, practically 75% uh, of, 70, more 90% uh, of the family I've known, they were all killed. So which means uh, there's no question that I, I was saved because of the job. <laughs> I've uh, had some downtime due to recent world events, so I figured I would make a record update video. I thought I'd show you all the records I've collected in this calendar year so far in, in 2020. Um, but on a serious note, you know, we all know what's going on right now. Um, the COVID virus is no joke. And uh, I hope you guys are keeping safe out there. I hope you're, you know, trying your best to, you know, stay clean, wash your hands, avoid large gatherings. Um, we're starting to see a lot of shutdowns of, of, you know, events and services here in the U.S. Um, you know, I'm in the performing arts. I've started to see a lot of cancellations roll through. And, you know, these things are inconvenient and they can be hard on a lot of people. I understand that. And, um, you know, a lot of people have things they were hoping to do. But I hope you guys put safety as a top priority. I'm going to be sharing um, a link to some CDC information in the video description because, you know, while these videos are fun and my channel should be fun, I want everyone to be safe, so that's down below. But um, a lot of people have a lot of time to sit and listen to records now, so I guess that's one uh, one silver lining of this whole debacle. So um, I've had some cool stuff come in on uh, in the last couple months, and um, probably my favorite thing that's come in so far. I'm going to talk about box sets first. Um, I got this in. This is the Analog Production Productions Yano Starker Bach box set. Um, you know, everyone's familiar with the Bach cello suites and most audiophiles are probably familiar with Janos Starker's recording of the Bach cello suites. But, um, just to give you a quick rundown, this, uh, the original Mercury living stereo release of, of this series of the Starker cello suites, um, is long been a sought after collector's item. Um, it commands big money in decent condition and it really is a treat. I've never heard an original. I have heard the, um, the Mercury, the seventies the Mercury issue that Phillips did of them. Um, and that was okay. I own the uh, speaker's corner box set of this that came out about 10 years ago. And, um, that was a three LP set cut at 33 RPM. This is a double 45 set cut from, I believe the original three track masters doing a three to two mix. Um, and all I really have to say is it's no competition. This is by far the best pressing of this record I've ever heard. If you're interested in classical music or you're familiar with these recordings or just want a really awesome demonstration disc, um, this is definitely worth your time. It might end up being one of the best reissues of 2020. So we'll see about that, but I'm really enjoying this. I actually, I think I'm going to break it open again later today and give it a spin. Mobile Fidelity has been putting out a ton of their one step reissues lately. Um, this one came out a while ago, but I, it, I, you know, kind of hesitated. I wavered on picking it up and I finally did. This is, the MoFi One Step Double 45 of Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks. Um, I do have the regular MoFi edition of this, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but this is a big step up. This is, you know, this is not my favorite Dylan album, but um, it is a, one of the better Dylan albums, and um, yeah, I, I think they just did an amazing job with this. I, I don't think I've heard a a bad One Step or a, a One Step pressing from MoFi that 
you know, if you're really into this record, the, the one steps are usually the version to get. I haven't been hearing about them being bested by any original pressings. And from, you know, the different versions of these that I've heard, I, um, I tend to favor the one steps. I did a, I did a review actually for audiophilia of the, um, the one step of yes is fragile, which I can probably link to in the description. And I have a couple of different copies of that record and uh, I've never heard anything like what the one step could do. So, um, the hype is real for the most part. Um, and then this just came out. This is, um, the MoFi one step of Monk's dream. And, um, I'm not super familiar with this album, but I know like in terms of, in terms of sound quality, there's not a ton of Thelonious Monk records that are like really audio quality. And, um, I really enjoyed the sound staging and presentation on this. I, um, I'm like, again, not super familiar with this record. It's, um, one that I've never owned before, but, um, I, I try to get more into Monk than I currently am because I know he's such an influential pianist and, um, really enjoyed this. This is quite nice. I do remember, I do have a story about that record. I do remember, you know, I've never owned any of the other issues of this album. But I do remember that at um, an audio show in Montreal, I went to the VPI room and they played the Impex reissue of that album. And I remember really, really enjoying it and going, God, I got to get a copy of that. And um, well, four years later, here I am. Um, so that's it for like the super, super special stuff. I have a couple more audio file reissues I picked up. Um, you know, MoFi is making its way through the Miles Davis catalog. So I got the latest ones of those. Um, Miles Smiles. Um, I have the speaker's corner of this record and um, again, MoFi have just done an incredible job with the entire Miles Davis series. You know, if you're a Miles Davis fan, the MoFi reissues are probably the best you're going to get. Um, Miles Davis, Porgy and Bess. Um, this one, I have the Sony mono reissue of this. You know, I think I ended up selling it actually, but that was nice. This is much, much better. And I kind of like Miles Davis's more ballad heavy music, like, um, you know, Porgy and Bess and um, Someday My Prince Will Come and stuff like that. Um, that tends to be the Miles Davis that I gravitate towards just because I, I love the way he uses, you know, kind of, he puts, he takes really beautiful lush ballads and, and just gives them enough of an avant-garde tweak that it makes them um, really interesting and kind of amplifies their their beauty, in my opinion. Been getting some stuff from Japan lately. Um, this is a Japanese '70s impulse reissue of John Coltrane's Crescent. Um, this is I've just been trying to fill in holes in my Coltrane collection because you know there's there's been really good quality reissues of a lot of it, but not of all of it. And um, I know people talk about Crescent a lot in terms of John Coltrane's mid to late output, and um, I think there was once an AP reissue of this album, but it's been long out of print and I'm sure it's incredibly expensive. So, you know, I said, instead I spent 20 bucks on a seventies Japanese reissue and, um, it sounds really nice. Um, this is another Japanese pressing, but this is, uh, a much higher quality Japanese pressing. This is John Coltrane's blue train. Um, I bought this because I have the 33 RPM version of, um, Music Matters pressing of Blue Train. And I was kind of, uh, from, from years ago, and I was kind of on the fence about, you know, this is, this is probably the John Coltrane album. And, you know, I kind of wanted to hear what they could do with the SRX vinyl. And so I was contemplating maybe getting another copy of the new XR, SRX um, system. And then it sold out and I went, oh, well, darn. Um, and then, I, you know, people have talked a lot about the King uh, King Japanese vinyl reissues of the Blue Note catalog and talking about how, you know, if you can't get an original pressing, you know, the Kings are often the second best thing. And, uh, so I kind of wanted to test that. I wanted to compare, you know, what is supposed to be the best of the older issues of this album against, you know, what Kevin Gray is doing in his mastering suite now with the Music Matters reissues. And, um, I haven't had the chance to sit down and compare them yet, but this is, so this is the Japanese seventies King pressing of John Coltrane's blue train. And, um, 
I have a feeling the Music Matters is probably going to beat it. I'm going to try to be as impartial as possible. And, um, you know, it never hurts to have a second copy of what is more or less a jazz standard. And I think Blue Train is a jazz standard. All right, last one. This is, um, I've been meaning to get a copy of this album for so long, and I just never, never got around to it. This is John Coltrane's Africa Brass. Um, this might be one of my favorite Coltrane albums. I've, I've been listening to it on Tidal for ages. I've been trying to hold out and, and see if I can track down a reasonably priced copy of the Speaker's Corner reissue of this album. And I just it never was able to. And, um, you know, I've been waiting for like another audiophile label to put it out, but so far nothing. So, um, again, I hunted for a 70s Japanese pressing because I figured, you know, I could get find one that was, you know, analog sourced at least and clean and so that's what I did with this it was not expensive at all and um, oh I forgot a classical record I did buy one classical record and uh, I've been meaning to check out this this company's reissues for a while and I never got around to it this is the analog aphonic reissue of Ricci playing Paganini's 24 Caprices it's a reissue of a SXL Decca and um, I haven't listened to this yet. I need to get around to it. But um, Analog Aphonic has kind of been um, catching my eye for a while because they're reissuing a lot of really hard to find um, classic classical recordings from you know the 50s and 60s. And their, their reissue pattern is kind of um, sporadic. I only have one other copy of, of a record by them, and that's... Um, that is Bernstein conducting Mahler II with the New York Phil, the 1980s recording. Or is it Mahler V? Ooh, now I can't remember. Um, I should have pulled it out before I started this video. But it's, it's, it's a Bernstein Mahler New York Phil recording. I think it's five. I think it is five from the late 80s. And the original vinyl copy on Deutsche Grammophon of that record is impossible to find. It's just horrible. And it was also sourced um it was also basically the cd um i think it was the cd quality master too um and analog phonic i think got a hold of if not a master tape at least they did a high res version I, I again i should have looked this up beforehand but anyway they reissued that record and um i have the cd of that album and now i have the analog phonic record reissue of that album and um of course the record is much much better um, but I've never, I've never tried their reissues with like, you know, classic analog recordings, like something like an old fifties Decca. Um, so I'm excited to try this. And, um, cause if these are supposedly cut from original tapes, they say at, um, the Emil Berliner studio in Germany and, you know, they have great equipment there. They did those, um, Brahms symphony box sets that are really the Brahms symphony box set. That's really fantastic. I did a video about that. So Emil Berliner knows what they're doing. So if these guys had access to original tapes and they got them cut at Emil Berliner, I'm, I'm, I have high hopes for this. And um, maybe in the next video, I'll, I'll tell you what I thought. Uh, I grabbed a few rock records. Um, this is a original UK pressing of David Bowie's Station to Station. I've had a Canadian pressing for the longest time, and I love this album. This is one of my favorite Bowie albums, um, definitely like top two or three. And uh, the Canadian pressing sounds nice. This UK pressing, though, is probably the, I would think it would be definitive. It sounds a lot better than my Canadian pressing, for sure. This is the MoFi reissue of Iron Butterfly's Inagata De Vita. I've had an original Atco pressing of this for a while, but it was a little beat up. Um, you know, it's been a while since I listened to the Atco. I kind of can't help but think this one sounds a little, um, not deader, but just it, a little less lively than the original Atco pressing. But that doesn't mean it's the Atco pressing is better. I just, um, I remember when I would play that old record, it, there would be a lot of energy to the recording. And I think maybe just due to the, the age of the tape, a little bit of that is lost with this, but it's still excellent sounding. Like if you don't want to try to hunt down a clean original copy, this is probably your next best bet. This is a pressing I picked up of Radiohead's OK Computer. This is a um, 2007 or 8 reissue by Parlophone 
And um, I have, oh God, the glare is awful, I'm sorry. I have um, the more recent reissue of this album um, by I think XL Recordings. And it, it sounded okay, it was all right. And then I heard a lot of people talking about how, you know, the mid 2000s reissues of the Radiohead albums, especially of this album, uh, these reissues used the original metal parts from the original pressing. So they were, they were all analog and basically buying an original, you were getting an original pressing for half the price. And whereas the, the ones that are currently out are, are nice, but they are basically um, high res digital masters, um, mastered for vinyl and pressed to vinyl. Um, so I was like, okay, well, let me get a copy of the OK Computer. It wasn't horribly expensive. It was around you know, $45 to, to hunt down one of these. And it, it's, you know, no comparison. Within the first two songs, I immediately knew this was a much, much better sounding record. So I'm probably going to sell the, the reissue I have because I love this album. It's really nice, but it's not one of those that I need to have multiple copies of. Um, cool. We got some Japanese records coming up. Um, you all know I collect Japanese music, and um, I've been trying to get more into Japanese vinyl lately because a lot of the Japanese music I have is on CD. Because a, a lot of the stuff I, I listen to and collect is from the, the '90s and the 2000s. But I've been trying to get more into, like, especially 1980s Japanese music because it was such a, it was such an interesting time for music and culture in Japan because Japan was experiencing a huge like economic boom or more or less a bubble and the culture was kind of evolving rapidly and and the music culture was changing in a way that was um, providing like a huge contrast against uh, a society that was heavily focused on like conformity so you'll see a lot of the music that started to emerge in the 80s in Japan was a reaction to like very very heavy societal conformity much in the way that, that the music that came out of the 60s was a reaction to like 1950s American conformity but I think in Japan it was taken to extreme examples on both ends. Um, so like the music, the music scene became a way to um, express oneself or express, you know, all these weird new ideas under the guise of like, well, this is just entertainment. So music got like really cool and inventive, I think, in Japan in the 80s. Um, one of the bands I've been kind of discovering a little bit is this band called Bui. And I picked up their album, Just Hero. Um, now, the music alone isn't necessarily groundbreaking or edgy. They're kind of a new wave band, but um, I thought they were interesting because people kept citing them as an example of like one of the first really successful and popular rock groups in Japan. Like, I know a lot of bands actually formed in Japan based off like seeing Bui on TV because up until that point, you know, Japan, Japan's popular music scene had been dominated by more like pop sensibility stuff, you know, um, you know, disco and a lot of people listen to like, a lot of people love Japanese like 80s city pop. I know that's a huge craze that's kind of um, sweeping the West right now is rediscovering like 1980s Japanese like, uh, uh, you know, club music or like dance music. But this was kind of a reaction to that. And so it, it's very interesting. This is a really well engineered album. And um, you know, Bowie albums are not really expensive to find. So I was just kind of curious about this band because they seem to be really important in the Japanese music scene. Um, another important band in the Japanese music scene was a band from the 70s called Happy End. And I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of this album, but um, this is their sophomore album. And it came out in 19, I want to say 1972. And this is widely cited as, um, I think Rolling Stone Japan called this the greatest Japanese rock album uh, ever made. And um, I have to agree, this is really awesome. If you are into like 70s progressive tinged, like folk rock, stuff like that, um, you'll probably really enjoy this. This is a late 70s reissue because originals of this record are, are really, really difficult to find. Um, and very expensive, and um, it just wasn't something I was willing to shell out a ton of money for. So I got a reissue, but it's a it's still an analog reissue. They probably were using the same tapes, so um, I'm not super worried about that. And this sounds really nice. Um, it sounded really great when I played it on my system. Um, 
you know, all the instruments were recorded really well. There's a nice sound stage. Um, the bass is really, really punchy on this, which is unusual for a Japanese pressing of anything. Um, and people in the West may know this band, even though you may not realize it, because um, one of the songs off this album was used in the Bill Murray movie Lost in Translation. So if you're a big Lost in Translation fan, you will recognize one of the tracks on this. Two albums left. Um, another 1980s Japanese album. This is Sakima 2, The End of the Century. Sakima 2 were a um, Japanese speed metal, proc metal band that was uh, pretty popular in the 80s. They, they kind of, they, they had outlandish stage antics. They were, I guess, visually kind of similar to Kiss. However, musically, um, they were more up there with... Um, bands like Iron Maiden and Van Halen and things like that. So if you know if you like Iron Maiden type music, you'll probably like Sakima too. And they were pretty influential for a lot of um, a lot of heavier bands that would come out of Japan in the late 80s and early 90s. And finally, um, this is an album from the late 80s. This is Z Kill's Reel of the World. This is, Z-Kill were one of the earliest adopters of like the visual K style in the late 80s in Japan. Um, they were friends with um, the guys in X-Japan. This, this album was released on X-Japan's label, Ecstasy Records. This came out in 1988, and um, it's a really early document of the early visual K scene in Japan, which kind of combined elements of goth, post-punk, uh, hardcore punk and metal. It was a weird fusion of, of all those genres. Um, and most of the visual case scene that got very, very popular in the early 90s um, never made it to vinyl because it kind of came around in the late 80s. But this is one of the few albums that is accessible and available that kind of documents that early scene. I hope you guys are enjoying some of your more recent vinyl finds right now because you probably have a lot of time to listen to them. Stay safe out there, everyone. Um, we have a really great community, and I wouldn't want anything to happen to anyone. So um, happy spinning, guys. Cheers.